Good morning, folks. Uh, can you all hear me just fine? Yeah? All right, great. My name is Ed Adams, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, connected cars, what could possibly go wrong. And in particular, I'm going to spend the second half of the presentation on a Department of Transportation program that many folks are not aware of, called the, called the V2V, or Vehicle to Vehicle program. <clears throat> uh, before I get started, uh, just a quick um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you could please uh, turn your cell phones to silent. Uh, if you're going to be texting the whole time, that's fine, but just uh, don't receive any inbound calls or, uh, or loud texts, if you please. And um, if at any point in the presentation you have questions, just raise your hand. This is by no means a scripted presentation. Uh, this is uh, as much a community education presentation more than anything else, uh, specifically about the vehicle to vehicle program. And typically, uh, when I'm making these types of presentations, and in 2015, I think I delivered this talk or a similar talk, maybe six or seven different conferences, usually by the time I start explaining what the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle program is, people start asking questions. So, what about this? What about that? Feel free. It's kind of an open sort of forum. Happy to answer those questions, and, uh, and we'll roll with it. So, how many folks here drive a car? Okay. Everybody except for the young girl in the front row. All right. <laughs> but, but you drive in a car, right? Right, okay. Uh, so this presentation will, uh, will affect uh, pretty much everyone in the room. And as I mentioned, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle program that we'll be talking about shortly uh, will also impact everyone in the room. Our automobiles now, it's not really connected cars. You know, they're not connected to the internet. They're actually part of the internet just like everything else that's connected to it. And I actually heard that from a couple of Toyota engineers that uh, when they were talking with me and they said, you know, Mr. Adams, cars are part of the internet. They already are. It's not something that's coming, it's already here. Uh, and that's a subtle difference, but uh, I, I agree with them completely. So if, if you accept the assumption that what is known as the internet of things is any physical object that can be connected to the internet, essentially have an IP address as part of the internet of things. And that includes everything from cell phones to washing machines to our automobiles. In fact, we had one of our engineers very recently, uh, he bought a refrigerator and he noticed that uh, one day uh, his network traffic was spiked and everything was very, very slow. And he, being a security engineer, kind of pinpointed it to his refrigerator because his refrigerator had a little LCD panel on it that his 10-year-old son would walk up and check the weather every single day. It was an IP address, it was connected to the internet, and unfortunately, it had been owned and was being used as a mail server. So he quickly unplugged that and disconnected it from his internet, I mean, uh, from his connection. But, but that's, that's, what, that's the world we live in. And the Internet of Things is certainly vulnerable. Everyone here knows this. This is a security conference. These are just some examples, everything from the target breach that folks heard about uh, to baby monitors, uh, you can tap in and, and actually uh, take over the video uh, stream so you can see exactly what's, uh, what's being monitored, uh, the Stuxnet attack from years back. And in fact, 18 months ago, if I had told you that hackers could keep you from watching a cruddy movie, you would have said that I was nuts. But that happened with the interview. So what enables the Internet of Things. Is it magic, now that our refrigerators are connected to the, to the Internet? No, it's software, and the magic of software, because software runs our world. Even the hardware that we hold in our hands and the cars that we drive, I was talking with a couple of folks from Security Innovation just this morning about uh, the new Teslas. And uh, one of the engineers was saying, uh, or one of our, our uh, employees was saying how he just recently test drove uh, the Tesla, the P85D, and he was very excited because they hadn't yet patched the car to limit it to 85 miles an hour on a test drive with software. They hadn't yet patched the car with software to limit the speed of the car. Software runs our world. So here's a quick little test. The new 787 Dreamliner has about six and a half million lines of code in it. Beautiful airplane. If anyone's ever flown in it, super smooth. 
F22 Raptor, 1.7 million lines of software in it. What about the S-Class Mercedes? Any guesses? 10 million lines of code. Come on, this isn't the price is right, you can go over. 15 million. 100 million lines of code today in your S-Class Mercedes, including over 100 computing chips, five networks, two miles of cable in your Mercedes. Two miles. 10 different operating systems and approximately 50% of that car represented in software. Software runs our world. Usually when folks look at this, they think, how is that possible? And those same engineers from Toyota that were telling me that cars are now part of the internet also joked with me and said, Mr. Adams, the only reason we put the wheels on the cars these days is to stop the computers from scraping on the ground as the car is driving. And it's actually close to the truth. 100 million lines of code in S-Class Mercedes. Phenomenal. And software is fallible. Humans are fallible. So imagine how many vulnerabilities are riding around in that Mercedes. On average, what is it? One vulnerability per thousand lines of code, something like that? A lot of software vulnerabilities in there. So is the connected car the next mobile platform? Well, in a lot of ways, it already has become. However, there are some differences. You know, classic network computer, typically turning that over, what, every two, three years? We have a policy inside of our, our company that every two years you can get a new computer. Well, the average lifespan of a car is over 10 years. What about over-the-air software updates? That's something that, outside of the automotive industry, it's almost a solved problem with respect to security and authentication. Not so in automotive. They're actually struggling with this. And in fact, the latest version of the uh, software from Ford is going to allow you to connect your Ford to your home Wi-Fi network to get software updates from Ford. You've now introduced all the potential vulnerabilities in your home network into your automobile through that chaining. Great convenience, great risk. And how many connected cars are there? Well, a lot and getting more. This year there's going to be, I think, uh, 55 million connected cars on the roadway. And within another five years, we're well over 150. So how are connected cars vulnerable? Well, you have external threats, you have internal threats, and then you have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle threats. And all of these threats, you might think, well, how reasonable is it? it really, Ed, the tire pressure monitor system, the TPMS, that's vulnerable? How do you hack that from outside? Well, you can. You're within three feet of the car, you can actually get access to what that particular monitor is broadcasting. All right, so we've established. Lots of software in automobiles, over 100 million lines of code in modern day Mercedes S-Class, and software is running our world. I'm also a research fellow at the Panama Institute, and recently the Panama Institute conducted a survey in the automotive industry, and they asked the software engineers in the automotive manufacturers a bunch of questions about, you know, my software, my company makes uh, secure software priority, yes versus no, etc. The one piece that I found most interesting is this question. How difficult is it to secure automotive software applications? And 69% of the respondents said it's either difficult or very difficult. These are the folks that are writing the software. These aren't external research companies. These are not security consultancies. These are the folks that are writing the software. And more than two thirds of them think that it's difficult or very difficult to write secure automotive software. Okay. And of course, the ever-present hacker threat. Many of us are very familiar with the recent Chrysler Jeep hacks done by the pickle and beer folks. But also, there's a, a book, an electronic book, published called Car Hackers. This is the 2014 edition. There's a later edition that's uh, almost finished right now. It's literally a book. It's freely available on the internet that you can download. It has a bunch of hacks for automobiles. Maintained by a guy named uh, Craig Smith. Very smart guy. Good guy. 
doesn't really want to, you know, hack cars for malicious reason. He wants to heighten awareness. But this is all, again, freely available. There's more. There was uh, Tesla getting hacked. OnStar. OnStar is an amazing story, actually. Uh, the OnStar system in General Motors cars was found to have a security vulnerability in 2005 that allowed remote control of everything except the steering and the braking system in the car. How many folks here have a General Motors car with OnStar? Anyone? A few, no one wants to raise their hand? No way. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. It's all been fixed. Uh, so these vulnerabilities that were discovered in 2005, when do you think the last one was fixed? Just a year, 2006? 2014, that's a pessimistic guy. Any other guesses? First time in 2005? La still not fixed. <laughs> uh, actually, they have been fixed. The last one was fixed in May of 2015, almost 10 years later. The difference between those vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities that were found with the Chrysler Jeep is all about responsible disclosure. The security researchers that found the OnStar vulnerabilities disclosed it to OnStar, but did not go public with it. General Motors actually acted quite responsibly, and I know you're saying, what, 10 years to fix vulnerabilities? That's not responsible. They actually acted quite responsibly and dug in straight away. The reason that it took them 10 years to fix all the problems is because the system was so antiquated that they had to do a lot of re-architecture and fix systems just so they can fix vulnerabilities in other systems. So it actually did take them nearly that, those full 10 years to resolve all the vulnerabilities. But again, they were being proactive about it. Their hand wasn't forced, uh, as was Jeep uh, and, and Chrysler, but it just goes to show the range of security vulnerabilities and responses that are available. And again, just uh, building the hurt, so to speak here. $30 Raspberry Pi device can unlock almost any keyless car. Freely available. That's a little disturbing, right? Someone walking down the a little mobile device or every pie on mocking cars. Here's another one. Uh, a lot of been, um, a lot of have been talked about the autonomous self-driving cars. Uh, this is actually a security vulnerability that was found by researchers at my company, Security Innovation, with um, about forty dollars of off-the-shelf equipment, you know, laser pointers and things like that. Um, the researchers were able to essentially take the car and uh, stop it, bring it to a halt, because we were able to spoof other cars and pedestrians. So the self-driving car thought that there was stuff around and it said, I'm not going to hit a pedestrian or another car, I'm just going to stop. When in fact there was actually nothing around except laser images. Okay. Now, let's talk about traffic safety. 35,000 deaths in this country and nearly 4 million injuries from automobiles 2013. Automobile fatality is still the number one leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 34 in this country. I remember when I was going to high school a long time ago. But part of the reason that all of these uh, associations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving and Students Against Drunk Driving got formed is because of that statistic. Because 25, 30 years ago, the leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 34 in this country was automobile fatalities. And it still is today. So, what does the U.S. government want to do about it? They want to put more software in your car. What do you think? Good idea? I think it's a great idea. And I'm going to tell you why in the next 15, 20 minutes. But I know this is a security conference. We're here because software is vulnerable. So folks are already starting to think. I can see it. No, I don't want more software in my car. I got enough software in my car. Let me explain. <clears throat> What the objective here is that specific metric re to reduce the number of high-speed fatalities in automobile crashes is the reason for the entire program I'm going to talk to you about coming up called the V2V program. It is an evolution of automobile safety. Back in the 1950s, we're driving around, well, most of us weren't driving around, some of us were, no seatbelts, 
glass that wasn't shatterproof, mostly metal cars, pretty unsafe. That evolved into things like seat belts and shatterproof glass. Then that later evolved into airbags and other kind of passive restraints. This is taking it to the next level to try to move it from active to proactive. And I've got a short video here to talk to uh, explain this or introduce this. Hopefully it works and hopefully you can hear it. Let's go. Hope it works. The next breakthrough in connected cars. Vehicle to vehicle communication or V2V works by passing messages between cars and roadside equipment to alert drivers of dangers that can't be detected by even the best onboard sensors. The U.S. government plans to make this life-saving technology mandatory for all new vehicles. Mandatory. While other countries are testing it out. In the past, the focus has been on helping people survive crashes. With V2V, we now have the technology to avoid them. V2V is predicted to prevent up to 80% of unimpaired driver accidents saving thousands of lives a year and making it the most important safety advance since the SEPA. But can hackers use V2V to disrupt traffic? Can the police use it to automatically issue speeding tickets? Will our privacy be at even greater risk than it is today? Can we really trust the technology? All right. That's the high-level introduction of the V2V system. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. Now, <clears throat> before I get too much further into the details of what V2V is, a quick disclaimer. I do not work for the U.S. government. I'm not part of the U.S. Department of Transportation. My company, Security Innovation, has been involved in this program since 2007, and our specific role was to help define the security and privacy components of the system to make sure that it's not only anti-tamper, but uh, protects anonymity and privacy of drivers. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. So just so you know, you know, how does this guy standing up here know so much about this program and you know, why should I listen to him? We've been involved for now nine years. But let me explain what it is. You may have caught in the video this is a mandatory program, mandated by the U.S. Department of Transportation. Every automobile manufactured in this country is going to carry hardware and software that broadcasts your speed and location constantly. I'll say that again. The U.S. Department of Transportation is mandating that all U.S. manufactured automobiles carry equipment that broadcasts your speed and location constantly. Why are they doing this? That last bullet. What is the system? It is based on a wireless protocol, 802.11p, and this hardware that's going to be in your car is going to be broadcasting your speed and location in about a 300 meter radius. It's going to be doing that a lot. <laughs> The reason it's doing that is so you can have a driver notification system to avoid the high-speed collision. And again, that last metric is really the driving factor here. The U.S. Department of Transportation estimates it's going to prevent 76% of non-impaired high-speed crashes. I don't know where they got 76%. They did some study. That's the number that came from the Department of Transportation. Moreover, the Transportation Secretary, Anthony Fox, called this the most important safety improvement since the seat belt. That's a pretty big statement for a politician to make. And I don't even think he's a politician. I think he's actually appointed. It also happens to be the world's largest certificate management system ever conceived, which has its own challenges. The objective here is to notify drivers. And let me give you a use case. I see a gentleman sitting in the audience, his name is Jeff. Jeff was recently test driving a Tesla P85D, a very fast car. Another gentleman I know in the audience, Cassio. Let's say Cassio drives a Ford Focus. Cassio's a practical guy. Jeff, not so much. But Cassio's very responsible. 
He's driving down middle of you know, downtown Los Angeles going through a green light. Jeff and his Tesla is going 75 miles an hour and he's about to blow through that red light and smash into poor Casio and his Ford Focus. This system will notify both drivers that there's a pending danger, a pending crash, and depending on the automobile manufacturer, can go as far as to stop the car to prevent it. Now at this point, folks usually start freaking out. <laughs> what do you mean my car is going to be broadcasting the speed and location constantly? What do you mean it can stop the car? To me, I think it's a brilliant program. Fraught with challenges, of course, which is why security and privacy professionals have been brought on since the beginning. And remember, when I say V2V, what I really mean is V2X, because it's not just vehicle to vehicle, it's also vehicle to infrastructure. Right now, for example, we've started a program in New York City. We're instrumenting five of the main avenues, like Park Avenue, etc. All of the stoplights at the interchanges is being uh, equipped with V2V hardware. So your car can not only talk with other cars, but also the infrastructure. Well, why are we doing that? It's to increase the data saturation, but it's also to, to solve a certificate management problem. Anyone here into kind of certificates and crypto and stuff like that? A little bit? Sure. Okay. Wow. A lot more than I thought. Great. Every automobile is going to ship off the assembly lines with a certain number of certificates. As you're driving along, these certificates are being used all the time. And as those number of certificates start to get depleted, it's a little bit easier to trick the system, spoof the system, hack the system. So your certificates need to get topped off. How are they going to top them off? You're going to go to your dealer every time you need, you know, kind of like a fuel gauge at your low on certificates. No, no one's going to do that. So we're building it into the infrastructure so folks can get topped off automatically. So Casio's Ford Focus, oh, Casio's down, is less than 30% certificates, repopulate them with new ones. Also, vehicle to roadside equipment. Vehicle, there's going to be aftermarket devices. So uh, Jeff's Tesla might come with the V2V technology in it, but Casio's Ford Focus might not because it was built before the mandate. Casio can buy an aftermarket device and equip his Ford Focus with the V2V technology. So you have the ability to opt in. Do you have the ability to opt out? You do not. Mandate from the Department of Transportation. Will people hack the system and opt out automatically by default? I'm sure they will. But that's one of the challenges. These are usually the biggest concerns that folks have. You know, will hackers be able to take control of my car? This system clearly is reading information from the CAN bus, which is basically the brains of a car, because it's pulling brake status. And it's pulling location from the GPS that's in the car. It's pulling speed from the tachometer in the car. So it's tied into some interesting uh, systems in the car. So that's always a, a concern. And will terrorists be able to raise havoc? One of these aftermarket devices, what if you know, someone puts it in a tennis ball that can be spoofed as a car and throws it in the middle of the I-10? It's going to create havoc everywhere. These are, these are concerns. Uh, there's also concerns about uh, what are known as VRU, Vulnerable Roadside Users. You've got to look at the government, they have an acronym for everything, right? Vulnerable Roadside Users are things like uh, bicyclists, motorcycle users, pedestrians. We want to protect those folks as well, right? Because they're part of that leading uh, the um, automobile fatalities. So they'll be able to buy aftermarket devices that are read only. They can't broadcast, they can't participate in the system because a mobile device can be anywhere but they can read. Also, privacy concerns. You know, will the NSA be able to spy on us even more than what they might be able to now? Because it's broadcasting speed and location. Can I be issued automatic speeding tickets? Again, Jeff, he's a jerk. He's driving 75 miles an hour in downtown LA, right? Shouldn't we be able to give him an automatic speeding ticket? The answer is no. These messages that are being broadcast they're being signed, but they're not even being encrypted. Why do you think the messages wouldn't be encrypted? No private information. There's no sensitive information in the messages. It's not saying that Cassio is going down the street or Jeff is going down the street. It's just saying a car is going down the street at so many miles an hour 
and it's about to collide with this other car. Now there are exceptions because there are certain vehicles that you want to be identified, things like police cars, fire trucks, ambulances. So you can know of pending problems up ahead, but also know if you need to step aside. You know, perhaps Jeff and his Tesla, he likes to you know, play Metallica at you know, maximum volume and he can't hear the siren, but he can get notified. There's an ambulance coming behind you, ambulance, ambulance. So he knows to pull over. And I'm sorry, Jeff, I'm really making out to be kind of a jerk. But <laughs> He's actually a nice guy. So messages definitely need to be secure. Authentication is key, integrity is key, anonymity is key. This last bullet's a tricky one. You have to be able to identify bad actors, not just malicious actors that are trying to hack into the system, but also systems that are just malfunctioning. So we have to be able to identify them and remove them, so repudiation. Uh, anonymity, definitely uh, have to be sensitive about this because folks are already freaked out about their privacy and public information. The fact is there are many other ways that an attacker or a hacker can gain access to your vehicle and your sensitive information than through this program. It's part of the reason that I built up so much of that hurt at the beginning about how vulnerable cars are. The system, yes, it's introducing new software into your car. It is not necessarily making you any less secure than you are today. It's making you more safe, that's for sure. Let me talk about some of the pilot projects that have been going on. In Ann Arbor, uh, starting in 2012, and we just concluded l last year, uh, we did a uh, 6,000 uh, car study. So we equipped a couple of corridors in the greater Ann Arbor area and you know, up to 8,000 cars, collected a, a lot of it, great information. The V2B program is a standard. It's now an IEEE standard, uh, IEEE 1609, if you want to look it up. Uh, the security and privacy pieces are IEEE 1609.2. Uh, this year, I already mentioned that pilot in uh, New York City. Uh, 2016 is basically going to be uh, equipping the infrastructure in 2017 and 2018. We're going to have a 20,000 vehicle uh, pilot project in New York City. The first cars to roll off the assembly line with V2V equipment are going to be the General Motors Cadillacs. Anyone want to guess when those Cadillacs are going to be rolling off the assembly lines with V2V equipment? Any guesses? 2018. 2018 is a good guess. 2017 is a better guess. You got it. This year, August. General Motors Cadillacs are rolling out the assembly line this August with V2V technology equipped in them. Now that's great for folks that drive Cadillacs, but at that point, Cadillacs will only be able to talk to other Cadillacs. So poor Casio and Jeff, they're not part of that system yet. The reason that General Motors is starting with the Cadillacs is because it's a higher-end system. This will add approximately $200 and $200 to $250 to the cost of a car. So in a high-end Tesla like Jeff is driving, another $200 is no big deal. In a Ford Focus, poor Casio, he might be on a bit of a budget. An extra $200, $250 a little bit harder. So the automobile manufacturers are rolling it out in the higher-end cars first. Once they start to gain scale and prices drop down, then they'll be rolling it into some of the lower-end cars. However, the government has already been acting. The Department of Transportation issued the mandate late last year and gave dates by which automobile manufacturers have to be compliant. It is, uh, I think it's 15% have to be compliant by the end of 2017, 50% by the end of 2019, if I'm not mistaken, 100% by 2022. It's only six years away. So between now and 2022, in the next six years, the automobile manufacturers are going to start adopting the V2V program slowly, most likely from the high end vehicles down. And <clears throat> there's also a lot of government interest in the rest of the software that's running in your cars. This is uh, Senator Markey from the great state, state of Massachusetts. And he's really took up um, uh, the charge here, and he commissioned a study called Tracking and Hacking Security and Privacy Gaps in, in uh, U.S. Manufactured Automobiles, uh, and his whole edict is that drivers should not have to choose between being connected and being protected. It's a great statement. Uh, so he and Senator uh, Blumenthal, I believe, introduced the SPY Act, not the best name, in my opinion. 
but that's what it's called. It stands for the security and privacy in your car. I don't know why they came up with that name, uh, but that's the name of the act. And it's going through uh, legislation right now, hopefully will become uh, a law in the near future. One of the things that I find interesting is this last bullet here, the cyber dashboard. Do you know when you go up and you buy a car and it's got the sticker on the side window, it tells you all the features, but then it tells you the miles per hour and the, you know, how much you know, carbon units you're consuming and stuff like that. That's what they're recommending for cybersecurity. That sticker also has to have some type of attestation with respect to the cybersecurity due diligence the automobile manufacturer has done themselves and put on their supply chain. And as you know, or might not know, the automotive supply chain is very broad. It runs all the way down to chipset manufacturers like NXP, um, BlackBerry, Synopsys, through system integrators, uh, Panasonic and NEC, the larger system integrators like the Continentals and the Delphi's and the Densos, and all the way to the automotive manufacturers themselves, the Ford, the General Motors, the Chrysler. And in 2014, Ford, for the first time in its history, hired more software engineers than hardware engineers. That was a tipping point for Ford. Another tipping point that we hit in 2015 is there were more connected devices on the planet than humans. It's a little bit of a disturbing tipping point, but none, nonetheless. Uh, and I recently watched um, Marvel's Avengers Age of Ultron. Anyone see that? That's a pretty cool movie, but man, <laughs> you start thinking about more connected uh, robots than, than humans and you start to, uh, to worry about it. Um, so the government is taking action. Remaining challenges. The public key infrastructure and certification uh, is still going to be a challenge. Even just the volume of messages that are being communicated, it's massive, absolutely massive. And the way that the system is handling it right now is you've got a couple of options. You can choose to implement a hardware crypto accelerator, or you can choose to filter messages that seem to only be likely to cause an alert. Filtering is actually more efficient than crypto accelerators, but automobile manufacturers have, have the choice. Automobile manufacturers also have the choice of how far to take the program. The mandate says you have to have the equipment installed and you have to notify the driver, but the automobile manufacturers can take it further. This is why I said earlier, an if designed, so, can stop the car. There are some manufacturers that we already know of that are planning to integrate this right into the braking system and offer that automatic vehicle stop functionality. Others are just going to maintain the minimum requirements of driver notification. There are also some cross-border issues here. Uh, the US and EU programs are hardware compatible. The standards are nearly the same, but not quite. No surprise. And the diff another main difference between the US and the EU is that in the US, it's a Department of Transportation, it's a government <coughs> mandate. In the EU, it is an opt-in program led by the automobile manufacturers themselves. Very European compared to what we do over here. But those two systems need to work together because another guy I see in the audience, Joe, Joe likes BMW. So if he goes to Munich, buys a BMW, drives it around the Autobahn for a few weeks and then wants to ship it back to the U.S., that BMW better work in the U.S. V2V system. So that's that harmonization that we're talking about. And today, it, it will. All right. Some reasons for optimism because I've got uh, plenty of time for questions. It is difficult to hack a car. Uh, we've got, I showed you some plenty of, of interesting examples, uh, none of them particularly life-threatening at this point, uh, but the awareness of car hacking is much, much greater than it was even a year ago, two years ago, and that's a good thing. There are useful parallels that we can draw on from connected car into the IT world, and the car manufacturers are finally being proactive, finally. So we can keep calm and we can drive, but I want to pause for questions. Anything from connected car to the V2V system, you want to know some details, what about this, what about that? Questions. But it's a security audience, come on. Yes. Yeah. So the question for those of you who couldn't hear it is, will the insurance companies be tracking all of these speeds uh, the answer for this program, the V2V program, is no. 
They can already do that, of course. Uh, if you opt into one of their programs where you take a, um, a dongle and plug it into your ODB2 port, um, ODB2 port, um, research those for vulnerabilities first, by the way. So the reason that they can't with this program is because there's no central logging of the information. There's no central storage of the information. There's no local storage of the information. So there's no black box in your car, for example, where if you know, Jeff crashes into Casio, they can't do forensics and look into the V2V program to see how fast he was going at that point in time. So that information is not logged or stored. Yes? So for those, uh, again, who couldn't hear the question, uh, with Liberty Mutual in particular, but uh, I think this might be the case for all of the insurance companies, if you do choose to opt into their, their dongle program, they can use that to justify a rate lowering, but not a rate raise, according to this gentleman here. There was a question in the back. Yes, sir. Great question. Um, they are using GPS primarily. Um, they are using a higher definition version of GPS. Um, and it has to be quite accurate, as you might imagine, because you're talking about high speeds and you're also talking about three dimensions. So if Jeff is going over a bridge at 75 miles an hour and Cassie is going underneath him, it can't notify that there's a problem there. So uh, it's, it's, a, a, it's a refined GPS system. So the answer to your question is actually the, the latter. Yes, sir. <laughs> Great question. Who is the certificate authority? Right now, there is no certificate authority in, in the program. Uh, so for all the pilot programs, whether it's Ann Arbor, New York City, and there, there some others, there has been a certificate authority for each one of those, but there is not yet defined a nationwide certificate authority for this program. <laughs> is it likely that's going to be the government? I think not, actually. Uh, it's probably going to be uh, an independent, for-profit organization that gets contracted by the Department of Transportation. It's almost all of the work that's been done on the program has been done by independent third parties under contract from the government. So although the government will pay for it, I, I seriously doubt they'll manage it from a CA perspective. Yes, sir? Absolutely. So some cars already do have some black box technology inside, particularly for forensics if you get into car accidents or things like that. So yes, some already do. This V2V program is completely separate from that. So yes, but they do. Yeah, for sure. Yes. of a question. Uh, do you think that um, because the new airliners and the fighter jets have su significantly lower number of software uh, lines in their systems compared to, say, an S-class Mercedes, is that because they are writing very efficient software? Is it because there's a hodgepodge effect in the cars? And then I'll get to your follow-up question later. Uh, so the automobile, so the, the 787 Dreamliner um, had the luxury of rewriting from the ground up all of the software in the entire system. Uh, so they write efficiently, they were able to start from scratch essentially, uh, similar to what Tesla was able to do, and, uh, and they do have some pretty darn good engineers, yes. In the automobile world, it has very much been a Frankenstein effect with respect to software. So you know, the, the, in the automobile supply chain is so fragmented that the folks that build the braking systems typically don't have a lot of interaction with the folks that build the fuel injection systems, and they don't have a lot of interaction with the folks that build it. So each system, as braking, for example, moved from mechanical to hydraulic, and then moved from hydraulic to you know, software managed, so they built the software there. And the same thing happened with an independent system on the fuel injection, and the 
So it's been kind of a Frankenstein effect, and that is part of the problem, for sure. For sure. Uh, and then the second part of your question, again, was... Right, uh, so uh, given that the standards, the automobile manufacturers are required to meet the standards, are they going to be using their own engineers, third-party engineers, and is this going to be just another you know, nodule in Frankenstein's net, right, essentially? Um, so um, they can use their own, their own engineers, anyone's engineers, they just have to meet the standard. Um, the standard eventually will be part of the NHTSS, the National Highway Transportation Safety Standard. It is the governing standard by which all U.S. manufactured automobiles have to adhere in order to put a car on the road. It includes everything from the shatterproof glass to the airbags, everything. These systems will be part of that as well. And uh, so right now, the mandate just says these are the min minimum requirements you have to meet. You can meet them however you need to meet them. You have to validate and self-attest that you've met them. And then there will be testing to validate that you, that you have met them. Because all of those NHTSS, National Highway Transportation Safety Standards, they're all self-attestation. And many folks don't realize this. The airbags, the shatterproof glass, all of the manu car manufacturers self-attest, yes, I have done this, yes, I've done that. And then there, there is random spot testing. And if any automobile is found to have failed any one of those standards, that's when they should recalls. And the same thing will happen with this V2V program. They'll be part of that. Yes, sir. Um, good question, uh, and I don't know what the answer is. Um, there's like yeah. Wi-Fi routers and things like that yep. on large airplanes that the airliner is not going to sort of take ownership of. Sure. And things like that, you know. And yeah. so I think that the scope of those two will probably be helping with the disparity sometimes. It could be, it could be, and I don't know if, if the uh, if the infotainment systems in the in the planes were included in there. I actually think it might have been, but uh, that, that's a good question, and it's something I'm going to research now. All right, uh, we are out of time. I very much appreciate your attention and drive safely. Thanks. <laughs>